Hey Crossroads, Pastor Luke here. Thanks for joining us again for another Bible study. We are in our deeper dive on the nation of Israel. We're actually getting towards the end. We've been looking at the leaders. If you missed any episodes, feel free to go back through YouTube and check them out. Also, while you're there, I'd love for you to like, subscribe, share, drop a comment, ask some questions. All that stuff is great. Last week, we were talking about King David, and so we're going to pick it up with a little bit more about King David and some of his lesser successful days. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rahab, but David remained in Jerusalem. All right. So the, the verse itself is saying, at the time when the kings go off to war, David stayed home. This is the start of a bad situation. And what happens is he actually encounters a lady named Bathsheba. So you might remember the story. If you want to go back and read the whole story, it's great. But there's a, there's a lot of detail that I'm going to brush over. But essentially it goes like this. David sees her, finds her very attractive, but it turns out that she is married. She's married to a guy named Uriah the Hittite. So David sends him off to war and basically makes sure that he gets killed because he found out that Bathsheba is now pregnant with David's child. But before he does that, he has kind of a scheme, right? There's a lot going on in the story that you kind of have to infer or that might make more sense if you're there. Here's one of the main things. Remember when we talked about kings and the idea of having kings? We said that kings take. They take the things around them, the wives and the children, the servants and the slaves, the, the food and the money and the crops. King David sees Bathsheba and decides that he wants to take her. Now, there's a couple of interesting things. One is, so it says that he sees her when she is taking a bath at her house. So there's a, there is plenty of debate on where exactly she was and what David was doing and why David was there. Remember, he stayed home from the war. Um, but someone put it to me like this, and this is not the final answer, but I thought it was interesting. When was the last time that you were taking a bath in your own home and you were unaware of whether or not people around could see you? This is not a typical thing that people do. People bathe all the time, not as much in these days, but still, it is not uncommon, it's not unheard of. When was the last time you were taking a bath and you didn't know whether or not you were public or private, visible or hidden? So there's definitely some room there. Regardless, David sees Bathsheba and decides that he wants to take her. So he calls Uriah home because now that Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, it's pregnant, David thinks, well, if he comes home from war, then I've got a great cover story. But here's the thing, Uriah won't go home. Now, the, what he says are things like, how could I go home and be in comfort while my men are off at war? How could I go home and visit my wife while you know, the men are off on the battlefield? These are true statements. But it seems like maybe Uriah's got a little tip off that uh, David has not been faithful, nor has his wife, or, or that there is some, some complications in this scenario, and he's refusing to give any kind of out. He's refusing to make things blow over. He's refusing to help because he actually sleeps outside the king's palace for the day that he's home, which is then why he gets sent off to war and killed. So there's all kinds of really interesting uh, intrigue and, and political drama going on. Regardless, Bathsheba ends up married to David by the middle of the chapter, and, and her husband is dead. She has a first child who passes away. This is the child that got the two of them into all the trouble. Her second child is named Solomon, and we're going to come to him in just a moment. And then her third child is Jedidiah. Another thing that's really interesting, this is not David's first son or first living heir Far from it. In a more political intrigue that we're totally skipping over, there's some fight for the throne. Bathsheba is made aware of the things, and she starts to work to make sure that Solomon gets the throne, which he does. Um, so ultimately, Solomon takes the throne. Solomon is trying to 
follow God. He's trying to be a, a good king. And so he's praying as a vision. He encounters God and he says in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart. This is God speaking back to my jumped verses. So that there will never... There, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. And then chapter four actually kind of reiterates even more of that. God gave Solomon wisdom, very great insight, understanding. There's never been anyone like Solomon. He has more wisdom than all these people. And so right after that, we start getting a, a story about the, there are these two women who each claim that one child is theirs and there's no way to, to figure it out. So, so Solomon says, well, we'll divide the baby in half and you can each have half. And the one lady goes, okay, fine by me. And the other lady says, no, give the baby to that woman. And so Solomon in his great wisdom recognizes that's the mother, the one who would rather give the child up than see, than see them die. And so we have all of this stuff about Solomon's wisdom, and there's mention, though we don't have them, of, of these other books of Solomon's sayings and wisdom. We do have um, other books in the Bible, like um, Proverbs and Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Uh, there's also like the story of the history of King Solomon, get another lost book. But we know that he does all kinds of big, big things. The biggest, the most significant is the temple. Now, David, his dad, had talked about building a temple and had said to God, said to Samuel, let's build a great temple. And God had said, no, it's not for you. So now, 1 Kings chapter 6, in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. It takes 13 years to finish the temple. And in the, in the Bible, it gives... All of these weights and measurements, they use this much gold and this much silver and this much, and estimates that I found if you were to like take that gold and the silver and the stuff that is actually given a direct weight and look at it in today's prices, it's like a billion dollar construction project. Anyway, the temple is huge and it's beautiful and it's really the pinnacle of the kingdom of Israel as a nation, as a people who now have their second king, they are building this gorgeous temple. It's really their absolute zenith. We're, we'll talk about other kings and we'll talk about them fast next week, but it doesn't go so well. In a lot of ways, actually, in the next son, Jeroboam, again, next week, it starts to go down. So this is, this is the apex. And so the temple is this gorgeous center of activity that, you know, the, they had used a mobile tabernacle. They had used a set up teardown. They had, they had some high places, which to be honest, are like shakily acceptable and appropriate. Or sometimes the high places gets weird, but it's sites of worship. Israel now has their temple and everything can finally revolve around this. Solomon's doing great, except he has just one problem. Um, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. That was, that was his wife. He has wives. He has lots of wives. Now, the Bible doesn't give a direct uh, understanding of his decisions, but we know that Solomon rules for 40 years. And somewhere around the, around the 20 year mark during the construction of the temple, he's being lauded as a good king, as doing all these great things. Now, Kings often have multiple wives, as do many of the other people. So you don't really know where the wives come in. But verse 3 is saying he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. So because his wives led him astray, as the verse says, it seems possible that he really got after that 20-year mark is kind of the point where he really started acquiring Foreign women, right? Acquiring is literally the word. He's just, he's just grabbing them. If you do the math roughly, 40 years, 1,000 women, it's basically, over the course of four years, a, a new lady every two weeks or so. And if he really only did that in like the last 20 years, which again, I'm speculating, I don't know that to be true, it's like a new, a new wife, a new lady every week or so. 
So you can certainly see in verse 4, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. Solomon has uh, achieved. He, he's done it. He's, he's done so much for God. He has been so successful. He has, he has wisdom. The Bible says, as no one has ever had. And because of that wisdom, that, that God-given ability, talent, blessing, he's successful. But he also ignores that. He ignores his own wisdom, his own know better, right? Trust me, any, you don't need much wisdom to know that a thousand women is not going to lead you to great success. He turns a blind eye toward himself and allows those things after, in the midst of his successes, to draw him away. Now, I don't know that any of us have ever been as successful that we're constructing billion dollar churches, but I think we can understand, hey, there are times of success. There are times when things are working. The things I'm attempting are being successful. What I'm striving after, I'm succeeding in, it's going well. Sometimes that's our biggest point of temptation, our biggest place of self-congratulation, of complacency, and those are the times where we can start to slide. We can start to lose track a little bit. Solomon did exactly this. He lost sight of God and lost sight of the reason that he was supposed to be using his blessings, the purpose for which he was supposed to employ his great talent and success. As I pray, praying that that would not be us, that we would not be distracted by such things. Lord Jesus, thank you for your work for your word. God, help us to see the lessons in your word in those who have gone before us. God, I pray that we would be successful for you, that we would endeavor to do great things for you. And God, I pray that we would do it, but that we would not be caught up in successes. God, that we would continue to focus on you, that we would consider to have our hearts and minds set on you, Jesus. I pray that you would enable us to live for you today in each and every day. And Jesus, I pray that you would bless each person who is with me right now. In your name, amen. Thanks, Crossroads. God bless. I'll see you next time.